and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with breast or gynecological cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. Because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. Now we have a few housekeeping reminders for you. All, pres all participants will be mutated, muted during the presentation. Once the speaker finishes presenting, we'll begin the Q&A discussion. Please submit any questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Remember that the speaker is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. We also have closed captioning available. You can enable this feature by clicking the transcript bottom button at the bottom of your screen and selecting the subtitle option. This webinar is being recorded. We'll share the recording in a few weeks with all of the registrants, and it will also be added to our website. Now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Pluar to introduce himself. Well, thank you, Kate. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, it's a real honor to be able to uh, speak to this group. Um, so just a little bit about me, I'm a breast medical oncologist and um, I am currently in Kansas City uh, and uh, I started and uh, direct a uh, uh, comprehensive uh, center devoted exclusively to the care of uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer. So from a clinical standpoint, that's all I, I do um, and a lot of uh, clinical research. Um, so uh, with that, we will get started. On one second here. Okay, so it was an interesting San Antonio uh, press conference, and uh, it seems that uh, sometimes the specific areas or type of breast cancer where there's the most uh, uh, activity or progress seems to go in cycles. So recently it's been a lot in HER2 and HER2 low. Um, but I think that we're kind of in a phase right now where uh, a lot's happening in ER positive uh, metastatic uh, breast cancer. So this just shows you uh, what uh, you, the- Can you, Dr. Kluwer, can you yeah. reshare your slides? What's that? Can you please reshare your slides? Oh, they're not up. Okay, hang on one second. and presenter mode. Okay. Perfect. Now we're good. You can see him? Great, thank you. Oh, okay. So this slide um, just is a summary slide of the clinical trials uh, in the, uh, that led to registration for the three CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are standard therapy in conjunction with anti-estrogen uh, therapy in first-line metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And you can see that uh, for the three drugs, uh, palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib, all showed uh, very similar progression-free survival. Uh, so the time that patients remain on treatment without disease progression is you know, just a little uh, uh, over uh, two years for most of the agents. Um, and then uh, in terms of overall survival, you know, there's a little bit of differentiation uh, in the overall survival with uh, ribocyclib uh, showing uh, a significant overall survival 
uh, with an increase in the overall survival of um, right around a year. Uh, and similar uh, overall survival uh, advantage for abemocyclib. Pelvocyclib, for uh, potentially a variety of reasons, hasn't shown as much improvement in overall survival as the others, but still a very effective uh, drug. And as you can see on the bottom, there's a little bit of difference in terms of uh, the uh, side effects. Most of the drugs have the neutropenia or lowering of the white blood count. Abemocyclib seems to be associated with uh, more um, diarrhea and GI side effects. Um, and then uh, the ribocyclib uh, can have some uh, liver uh, effects as well. So this is our current standard of, of care. And I think um, there's really very little question right now uh, about what to do in uh, first line metastatic ER positive breast cancer. The question really that um, remains open right now is when this treatment stops working, what's our next choice of uh, therapy? And to make those decisions, we, we've kind of refined our, our thinking a little bit uh, with a new definition of what is endocrine resistance. Um, and so it's defined in, in two ways right now. Primary resistance is when the relapse or progression, relapse on adjuvant endocrine therapy within the first two years or a progression within the first six months of starting first line endocrine therapy uh, in the metastatic uh, breast cancer setting. Conversely, secondary resistance uh, is if you relapse on adjuvant endocrine therapy after two years, or if you relapse within 12 months of completing your uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy, or if your progression uh, on first-line therapy is after six months on treatment for metastatic breast cancer. And these definitions are really um, uh, becoming more useful as we try and identify uh, mechanisms of why uh, these cancers become resistant uh, to treatment. So after uh, first-line treatment with endocrine therapy and CDK4-6 inhibitors, um, some of the treatments that we previously relied upon, um, such as fulvestrant, um, if you had an aromatase inhibitor as your first line, anti-estrogen. Um, so fulvestrin used to be our standard, um, but multiple studies have shown that uh, after treatment with CDK4-6 uh, inhibitors in the first line, the benefit and effectiveness of fulvestrin in the second line is, is limited. Um, in some studies, it's as low as two months. Others, uh, it's uh, around up to five months, but it's kind of in that ballpark of three to five months, whereas previously it was about double that at least. So we've looked for other strategies to try and improve uh, second line therapy. And one of those potential strategies um, is to consider switching the endocrine agent and continuing the CDK4-6. The thinking being that um, you know, if you're on two drugs and the combination stops working, is one drug uh, responsible uh, for, you know, losing its effectiveness or both drugs? And if it's only one, which one is it? So, um, so the maintained study looked at um, switching the anti-estrogen uh, agent that you were on in first line and continuing the CDK4-6. And in this study, um, most of the patients had received um, an aromatase inhibitor and palbocyclin in the first line. And so they were switched, their endocrine therapy was switched to fulvestrant um, if they were on an AI. And all the patients were uh, switched to uh, ribocyclin if they continued on the CDK4-6. So the, the patients were randomized to either um, endocrine therapy alone or the new endocrine therapy alone or uh, continuing uh, with um, ribocyclib and endocrine therapy. And you can see on the, in the 
bottom line uh, that uh, the addition of uh, or the endocrine combination of endocrine therapy and riboscyclib had a significant uh, benefit um, but to increase the progression-free survival from 2.8 months with an antiestrogen alone, which is consistent with what we see with fulvestrin, uh, to 5.3 months. So it's of some benefit, but not a huge benefit uh, to, to that strategy. So where we really need to go is to start looking at precision oncology um, in second line uh, hormone receptor positive disease because we know that there are a number of mutations uh, which are detailed here uh, in the uh, table um, where we have already uh, specific drugs that could target uh, these mutations, which we believe are the driving force, at least to a large extent, uh, in the uh, sustaining and promoting the growth of these, these cancers. So the most common one that we see uh, after antiestrogen therapy in the first line metastatic setting is the development of mutations in the ESR1 gene, which is the gene uh, that encodes the estrogen receptor. And this is an acquired mutation. So um, when you, if you look for this mutation in patients who um, have recurrent disease after completing adjuvant endocrine therapy with an AI, it's very uh, infrequently found. About three to five percent of patients will have the CSR1 mutation. Alternatively, if you look after uh, disease progression on first line aromatase inhibitor in the metastatic setting, about forty percent of patients will have a, their their tumor will have acquired uh, this mutation. And the importance of that is is that our our standard antiestrogen therapies, uh, aromatase inhibitors, fulvestrant, um, are not very effective uh, when you have the ESR1 mutation uh, because the receptor is activated independent of uh, any estrogen. So, uh, but there now is a drug, elicestrant, uh, which is an oral SERD, uh, which is the same class of drug as fulvestrin. It's a selective estrogen uh, receptor degrader. Elicestrin, however, is a little bit different because it binds uh, to a different uh, component of the estrogen receptor and will actually block the activation that the ESR1 mutation uh, is causing. And so that, that was approved um, earlier this year, about a year ago um, now. Uh, for patients who uh, are known to have that ESR1 mutation. And it's, it's shown pretty significant uh, improvement in disease uh, control, um, particularly when you look at, compare the group with standard endocrine therapy versus an ESR or elicestrant treated in patients who have an ESR1 mutation. It's significantly better. The second mutation that we see is PIK3CA, which uh, encodes for a protein called PI3 kinase, and we'll talk a little bit more about this because PI3 kinase is a, a critical pathway uh, in ER uh, positive breast cancer. It is uh, also, uh, PI3 kinase is also a critical node in how the body manages uh, glucose um, levels and um, Thus, blocking it causes some significant uh, side effects. Um, but we now have uh, two drugs approved, alpelacib, which inhibits PI3 kinase, capifacertib, which was recently approved a few months ago, which inhibits AKT, and enavilisib, uh, which is not yet approved, but uh, we'll see uh, a little bit later in the talk that there's some really uh, interesting data that uh, uh, came out uh, at San Antonio. So AKT mutations and ANP10 mutations um, occur relatively low, three to four to four to five percent, but they are also responsive to treatment with uh, capifacertib. 
And then the um, um, DNA uh, repair proteins, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2 um, occur, you know, in various frequencies in germline mutations in hereditary situations. Uh, but they can also be acquired uh, by the, the cancer cells themselves. Uh, so even in a patient who does not have hereditary breast cancer, their tumor may develop a mutation in one of these repair proteins and still be uh, responsive to uh, treatment with the PARP inhibitors, uh, olaparib or telazoparib. And then lastly, um, and this is a little bit different than the HER2 low story, but um, in HER2 negative uh, cancers, like hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, uh, there are some uh, tumors that re uh, develop a mutation in the HER2 uh, pro protein itself. Um, and those patients uh, can benefit from uh, HER2 targeted drugs, particularly uh, neratinib, uh, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, when combined with Herceptin. It's important that in invasive lobular cancer, this, this mutation seems to be uh, somewhat more common in about six to seven percent of patients with invasive lobular cancer. So we have a lot of uh, specific targets now and new drugs that uh, can really impact uh, the outcomes by targeting these uh, specific mutations. So this is uh, a busy slide up top if you want lots of detail, or at the bottom, a very simplified version. So as we talked about, PI3 kinase is a critical uh, component in uh, maintaining uh, the growth of breast cancer cells that are estrogen dependent. Um, and so it's a signaling cascade, much like tipping over dominoes, uh, where PI3 is activated, then it uh, activates AKT down through mTOR, which is another protein, and ultimately leads to the cell uh, progression and proliferation. So P10 is actually a negative regulator. It's kind of a break on this pathway. And so when you get a mutation in P10, which as we saw was about 5%, that actually releases the break and this pathway can uh, continue uh, without restraint. So the drugs we have available right now are Apelacib here, uh, which blocks the PI3 kinase protein, Everolimus, which has been around for a long time and can block the mTOR pathway, and then we have the new capifacertib, which blocks the AKT uh, pathway. So just to go through this a little bit in, in detail, so SOLAR1 uh, was the trial that led to the approval of alpelacib, um, and it compared alpelacib and fulvestrant uh, versus uh, placebo and uh, fulvestrant, and they studied it initially in both patients with uh, tic 3 aca mutations and those who did not have mutations. And it turned out that the benefit um, for this drug was really only in the mutated uh, cancers. And you can see here that the progression-free survival is essentially doubled uh, comparing um, alpelacib versus uh, plus fulvestrant versus fulvestrant alone. Um, so a pretty significant um, uh, benefit uh, there for most of these patients were second line uh, treatment in ER positive breast cancer. Now the downside of it is alpelacib is a, a, a challenging drug uh, for patients and um, about two thirds of the patients will get hyperglycemia or elevation of their glucose and about in one out of three patients that can be fairly significant. Um, and sometimes requiring insulin. It also has a pretty significant frequency of rash um, with over 50% of patients developing some rash. We actually now pre-treat everybody uh, with antihistamines on a daily basis uh, to try and minimize that risk. 
It also can be associated with uh, diarrhea in a significant number of patients. And it turns out that about one out of four patients have to stop this uh, drug due to uh, side effects. So while it does have um, uh, significant activity, it also has a uh, challenging side effect uh, profile, uh, which can definitely impact uh, quality of life uh, while on this. So um, we need to get better drugs and uh, to target this pathway given how common it is, the mutations in this pathway are, and how uh, important it is. So yeah, so here now we've added, we'll talk about capifacertib, which is a new AKT inhibitor. And, and the, the importance is, is that if this, if this blocks here, it blocks everything above it, right? Because this is kind of like the dominoes tipping over. And if there's something, uh, you know, impeding this signaling, then that will, regardless of whether the PF3 kinase is mutated or the AKT, it's going to have similar effects. And so this was the, the study that led to the approval of uh, uh, capofacertib. Again, it was very similar in design. It was the capofacertib uh, plus fulvestrant versus placebo and, and fulvestrant. And the, the uh, capofacertib has a very unique uh, administration schedule where you take it four days uh, out of seven. So every week you're four days on and uh, three days off um, in order to try and uh, manage the uh, potential side effects that schedule evolved over uh, many different iterations of the study. And this is the actual uh, uh, endpoint. This is the overall population. So again, they enroll patients uh, with the, mu the mutation in the PI3 kinase pathway um, or without. And you can see that there's some benefit here, but really there's sig more significant benefit um, with more than a doubling of the progression-free uh, survival in those patients who had mutations in the PI3 uh, pathway. And that could be either in AKT, it could be loss of P10, or it could be a PI3 kinase uh, mutation. So any of those three um, proteins in that pathway that were mutated uh, were eligible to participate in this trial and seem to all benefit uh, very similarly. Okay. So now let's shift gears because those are the highlights regarding ER positive breast cancer. I think um, in the next 12 months, we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, new strategies and potentially new drugs approved for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. One of the exciting areas uh, is uh, really uh, companies have developed um, PI3 kinase inhibitors that are specific for the mutated version of PI3 kinase. So they don't affect the normal PI3 kinase that's in uh, the liver and controlling glucose uh, balance. So it really uh, reduces the side effects and the toxicity. So back to triple negative uh, breast cancer. So this is a um, study that or data that was presented um, from a study called Begonia, which is looking at a variety of uh, different uh, treatment strategies. So this arm looked at uh, a drug called datapodimab um, and dervolumab. dervolumab. Um, so dato uh, is actually an antibody drug conjugate, um, much like uh, Tridelvi. So it targets the same protein, trope 2, on, on the cancer cells, and um, it carries a chemotherapy payload that is act, actually is the same uh, payload that's seen that's found in NHER2, um, which is another antibody drug conjugate uh, which targets um, HER2 protein. So, and Derva is a uh, 
uh, anti pdl one inhibitor, um, much like uh, Keytruda. Uh, so this is uh, a first-line treatment in uh, metastatic uh, triple-negative breast cancer. And in that context, we know that um, uh, about 40% of patients will be pdl one positive and will be candidates to receive immunotherapy with Keytruda in conjunction with their chemotherapy. Um, so this really looks at both groups, um, whether uh, there's pdl one expression or not. And so, and the overall response rate um, in the um, patient population at first line, regardless of their pdl one status, was uh, 80% um, and a median progression-free survival of almost 14 months. So this is really uh, promising. It's a small study, um, but it's a very well tolerated uh, treatment, and um, you know it would open up uh, immunotherapy uh, to 60% of the patients with triple negative breast cancer who currently uh, are not uh, uh, eligible to receive Keytruda. So this is moving forward to already a phase three uh, trial uh, in progress. And hopefully these uh, results are confirmed in the phase three trial, and this will add another uh, treatment option to uh, uh, for triple negative breast cancer. And then there was some uh, news in her two positive disease as well. Um, when you look at the HER2 targeted drugs that we have available now, um, they really are in two, three forms. So one is the monoclonal antibodies, um, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and then margituximab, which is uh, a genetically engineered uh, HER2 targeted monoclonal antibody. These all bind somewhere outside the uh, cell membrane and inhibit signaling and um, the antibodies getting together uh, and blocks the signaling. And then we have what are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and they work on the inside of the cell where the signal that's coming through the HER2 protein triggers activation of multiple pathways to lead to cell growth. So lapatinib and neratinib are already approved, as, as is tacatinib uh, uh, in the last couple of years. And then we have um, the antibody drug conjugates, which um, trastuzumab deruxtecan um, is probably the most widely known, also known as NHER2. And the, the mechanism of action of these drugs is really unique because um, it leverages the antibody to identify the cells, uh, the cancer cells that are expressing the HER2. And then attached to the antibody is actually uh, a chemotherapy uh, drug, um, which is attached via a linker. And so once the antibody binds, the entire uh, uh, compound is ingested into the cell and um, there, the linker is dissolved, and the payload is released. So the, the chemotherapy payload is now inside the cell, but only those cells that have the HER2. And that leads to uh, cell death. Um, and then there's a, a, a secondary component called the bystander effect, where as if this drug is able to permeate through the cell membrane, it can get out into the microenvironment and actually be taken up by other uh, cancer cells, uh, or as we call them, bystander cells that don't have the HER2 expression. So it's really, uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan has been transformative um, in the treatment of uh, uh, HER2 positive disease. So we continue to look for um, you know, non-chemotherapy uh, strategies, uh, because if we can find effective treatments, 
that do not involve the toxicities of or minimize the toxicities of chemotherapy, we can uh, have better quality of life as well as uh, better outcomes. So xanadatinib is a um, new uh, bispecific uh, antibody against HER2, um, and it works a little bit differently um, because if you go back to the previous slide for a second, um, so trastuzumab and pertuzumab are used in combination, that's uh, Herceptin and Pergetta. They bind to two different areas on the HER2 protein. Um, and they actually have two different effects in those binding areas. Um, what um, uh, Zani does is it binds, a single antibody will bind to two different spots on the same HER2. What this does is it leads to a lot of clustering of these, these HER2 proteins as they're attached uh, both together um, as well as um, individually. And so the goal of this is really to try and develop uh, in those patients that are triple positive, as we refer to them, who are HER2 positive and hormone receptor positive, uh, to develop a non-chemotherapy uh, treatment regimen. And so the combination is the, the bispecific antibody, um, along with uh, pelvocyclin, which is uh, ibrant, and fulvestrant in those patients who are both HER2 positive and hormone receptor positive. And we know that there's a lot of um, sort of cross uh, reactivity or crosstalk between uh, HER2 and the ER. So um, they're not completely independent. So blocking both of them uh, uh, makes sense uh, to get better efficacy. Oops, I forgot I had this slide in here. So there you go. This is how it cross-links um, two different HER2 proteins by binding um, at two different sites. And this is just, uh, so this was a phase two study, and this just shows you the response. And you, you know, these are called waterfall plots, um, and you can look at them and see. So any, this is the baseline right here. And so any bar going down represent the patient who's responding. Uh, um, and any um, bar going up is the patient who's progressed. So you can see that the vast majority of patients showed a uh, response uh, to the treatment. So this is um, uh, moving uh, quite quickly into uh, two different phase three trials um, to look at uh, chemo chemotherapy-free uh, treatment strategies uh, in triple positive uh, disease. And then lastly is uh, HER2 Climb uh, O2. So um, as many of you are probably aware, the drug Ticatinib, which is one of the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors, is approved um, for the treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer in, in combination with uh, it's a LODA and Herceptin. Um, and right now it's utilized mostly um, after trastuzumab deruxtecan um, or in patients who have uh, brain metastases. But catnib was studied and really the first drug to ever be studied in patients who had untreated brain metastases from HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. And it showed that in, in that combination with uh, Zolota and Herceptin, that it actually had uh, a response rate in the brain of 50%. But also, uh, it delayed or prevented the time to patients uh, developing a new or uh, a new uh, brain metastases. So the uh, goal has been to try and uh, see if ticatinib could be combined with other drugs and perhaps uh, more uh, upfront in the treatment uh, regimen rather than third line. And so this trial, uh, which HER2 Climo 2 was started uh, before trastuzumab deruxtecan uh, was uh, approved uh, and before it was tested uh, against 
trastuzumab and tamsine, which is TDM1. The TDM1 used to be our standard second-line therapy in HER2-positive disease. Then it was replaced by uh, TDXD. But this study looked at, could you add to catnib to TDM1 um, in the second line, and could you uh, improve the outcome and maybe possibly present, prevent uh, CNS metastases from developing? Because we know that through the course of treatment for HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, almost half the patients will develop brain metastases. And we really want to utilize systemic treatment and focal stereotactic radiation to try and manage those and avoid whole brain radiation. So this is this, the study design. It was TDM1 with or without uh, tocatinib. And this, this is the outcome, and it shows that there is definitely an improvement um, that's statistically significant in terms of uh, delaying progression by two months, um, and it's more pronounced uh, uh, in the brain metastases um, of the benefit. Um, so, um, you know, it, this kind of proves a couple of things. One is that you can combine tocatinib with an uh, antibody drug conjugate safely, and there is some benefit. Um, with TDM1 um, now moving to after um, to follow um, trastuzumab deruxtecan in the treatment uh, uh, sequence, uh, it still uh, becomes a useful uh, combination to use after uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan. And this, this uh, uh, strategy of utilizing uh, Tocatinib earlier has actually uh, moved to first line uh, treatment in the metastatic setting, which right now our standard is a taxane, either taxotere, less commonly taxol, combined with Herceptin and Pertuzumab. And then after six cycles or so, um, the chemotherapy is dropped if the cancer is responding, and then maintenance uh, trastuzumab and her Pertuzumab are continued uh, until there is progression of the disease. And so there's a study um, looking at adding tocatinib to that maintenance phase of um, perceptin and, and uh, pertuzumab to see if it can improve uh, the disease control and actually prevent the development of brain metastases in HER2-positive metastatic disease. So, that's all I have. Uh, it's a lot of information in this short period of time, but happy to take any questions. Yes, so thank you, Dr. Pluard. Let's start the Q&A. You can submit the questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get through all of the submitted questions, but we may not be able to due to time constraints. Um, so in the beginning of your talk, you discussed primary resistance and secondary resistance. I'm really, um, you know, uh, interested in hearing about that because I haven't really heard about that. And I wonder how, you know, how you look at that and you know, how does that, uh, what does that mean to a to the patient? And, you know, what do you look at to, and how do you change maybe the treatment based on those, that information that you're, you're seeing? Yeah, so, um, didn't have the, uh, um, so I think um, one of the things, and I didn't uh, go over it, is the, um, there was a late breaking study looking at uh, patients who had primary resistance uh, on adjuvant endocrine therapy, um, and those patients in, in got uh, who had a PF3 kinase mutation got not only uh, CDK4-6 inhibitor um, in addition to their endocrine therapy, but they got a PF3 kinase inhibitor in combination. And um, the results were really significantly better 
than what we see with CDK4-6 inhibitors alone. So I think that, you know, right now we really are focused on trying to understand what the mechanism of resistance is in those patients because it seems to carry forward. And if they um, progress rapidly on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, then their next treatment is likely also to uh, not have a very long duration. So we need better better strategies there and we need some understanding. So identifying that patient group is a, kind of the first step in, in sort of being able to study them uh, in a standardized fashion. So we have a few questions. I want to try to organize them so they're all um, on the same topic. Um, we have a lot of questions asking about um, resistance even. And one of the questions is interesting here. So um, if you're on fulvestrin and progression occurs um, and you're only on fulvestrin, um, they're wondering, do you add a CDK4-6? And the other, you know, another thing that comes up is if you're on fulvestrin and perhaps you had an AI maybe early mm -hmm. stage and then you're metastatic and you're on fulvestrin, I hear everyone saying, um, you know, the ESR one mutation after an aromatase inhibitor. Is it happening <laughs> at, at, with fulvestrin as well? It does. It does. It, if you've never had an aromatase inhibitor in the metastatic setting, um, the likelihood of developing a ESR1 mutation with fulvestrin alone is lower, but it still can happen. Okay. So um, as far as the ESR1 mutation or any mutation, um, any mutation goes. So a question here is, if you have this mutate treatment mutation, say a PIC3 and, or an ESR1 or any of those that are that are developed during treatment, do they ever go away or will they always be there? Um, that's a great question. Um, so the PIK3CA mutation is, is one that's present early on. You can usually find it in the primary tumor if you look deep enough. So the SR1 mutation is acquired by treatment pressures. So generally, um, uh, once you have that mutation, it's probably going to remain present as the dominant subpopulation. And do you begin looking for mutations like right away? What do you recommend? Um, you know, after first line, first progression, and do you continue looking for mutations? Yeah, so our, our uh, approach is that when we biopsy someone to confirm their metastatic disease, we will usually, and if, at the time that they first develop metastatic disease, whether it's a recurrence or de novo, uh, we will send that for genomic sequencing on the biopsy specimen. And then subsequently, we use uh, liquid biopsies at the time of progression where we look at circulating DNA to identify mutations. Uh, sometimes we re-biopsy patients, um, uh, particularly you know, if it's part of a clinical trial, but uh, liquid biopsy is very useful at identifying subsequent mutations. And we can do That's it- That's really great to hear. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we can do it repeatedly, right? Because if you yeah. don't have an ESR1 mutation after your first line endocrine therapy, and you go on to second line, and then you progress, we test again because it can evolve over time. Okay, great. So that was one of my questions. You know, do you test, um, do you need to re-biopsy or a blood test and use a liquid biopsy? Um, it sounds like you would prefer to use a liquid biopsy to try to get these this information. The subsequent one, yes. Um, unless, you know, um, and the, the benefit of liquid versus tissue is um, there can be different mutations in different tumor locations, right? We've, this has been studied. Um, and so some mutations are truncal and they're in all the cells. And then you, like a tree, you can have branch mutations. So the, the beauty of a liquid biopsy is you're getting the bottom of the funnel, 
because it's all getting into the blood. And so you're seeing the DNA from all the sites in the body. That's great on our end too, because, you know, as you know, liquid biopsy is so is less invasive right? or hardly any at all because we're already getting our labs drawn. So that's super easy to do. Whereas a biopsy can be very difficult for patients. So um, right. that's good to hear. And do you find as far as like reliability and, you know, is it just as reliable as? Yeah, Are so you ever concerned that maybe, maybe it's not, not a good idea? Um, sometimes if we get negative results and we don't, you know, and because if the tumor is not actively growing and, and shedding the DNA into the bloodstream, you may not find it. So sometimes if there's not a, a large burden of tumor, you may not find the DNA. And then in that situation, you know, we determine whether there's enough need to warrant another invasive biopsy. Okay. Um, and can you find all of your answers? Like someone's asking me about P10 loss. Is that tissue only liquid or tissue? Um, you can find P10 because it has a mutation, but it's a loss of function, to be clear. So, so it's not a complete loss of the gene. Okay. So that can be seen but, in the, in the liquid biopsy. So, right. okay. So um, there's a question regarding how are the side effects with Kabi, uh, compared, like comparing Kabi, Kapiva Sertid and Alpelbacid. And then I wonder, um, you know, the new drug also that um, that may yeah, or may not become approved, the anivalisib. Um How are those yeah, side so, effects? Yeah, um, so the side effects of... Um... Uh, Capifacertib are, are similar to alpelacib in terms of their nature. Um, there can be some elevation in glucose. It's generally not as prevalent at all, uh, as prevalent as nearly as much as uh, the um, alpelacib. There can be some rash. Again, it's much lower in incidence. And then diarrhea um, is probably you know, the of those three, probably the most prevalent one in capifacertib. And you can see a little bit more in terms of um, uh, blood count effects in capifacertib than you do with alpelacid. Um, so, and then the new one, um, I know if it, I know, Nova, Nova Lissig, <laughs> um, uh tends to have, it, although it's the same target, the PI3 kinase as alpelacid it seems to have significantly less side effects. So if okay, <laughs> these drug names are quite quite a mouthful. So if approved, where might Zanid Zanitinumab? Oh, there mm -hmm. you go, Zanatinib. Okay, fit within the lines of treatment those uh, with triple positive. MVC. Um, so probably it's something that you would consider uh, second line. Um, I think you know first line is, is until we have you know head to head comparison still going to remain uh, the taxane receptor pertuzumab. But once there's progression on that um, and you're you're triple positive, then th this would be a nice combination. We, um, there is some data uh, using similar uh, uh, strategy from Monarch per uh, trial, looking at a bemocyclib um, with anti sylvesterant and Herceptin. Um, hopefully this, I mean, it was a pretty uh, encouraging uh, 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 response rate in that study. So uh, hopefully that will uh, be better. So I, we see, we keep seeing a lot of combinations being made because we know that, you know, treatment appears to be better when you combine things. Um, 
but it's so concerning to see these these medications all being um, combined and worry about the side effects and how we're going to manage those as patients. Um, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's something I mean, that's always, there, it's always an issue, right? Because when you combine two drugs, you get, hopefully you get better effectiveness, but, um, you know, you may also get more toxicity. So I think, you know, as we get better with drug design, um, hopefully we'll see minimal, uh, you know, fewer side effects. Um, but um, yeah, there's there's definitely a cost uh, to that, um, combining to combining the drugs, which is in general why we don't do it with chemotherapy, um, because you know we know that if you combine chemotherapy, you're going to get a lot more toxicity. And we've done studies in metastatic breast cancer that show that giving a single drug and then giving the second drug when the first one loses its effectiveness is equally as effective in the long run as combining them. Yeah, and that's what we like to have, you know, obviously we'd like to look at quality of life where we're looking at. Um, also, we'd like everything, right? Progression-free as well as Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's the goal. That's, As good quality of life, I mean, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's critically important. So we have a um, a question about ticatinib in her too low disease. And I think the question is asking, um, we had, you had talked about her too positive disease and especially in brain mats and wonder if there's any information regarding its effectiveness in HER2 low, or is that only in HER2 positive disease? We don't have any data in HER2 low for Tucatinib. Um, the HER2 low patients don't have nearly the same frequency of developing brain metastases as the HER2 positive do. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the the difference in um, in the HER2 low group, right? There's not a lot more protein, whereas in on the surface of the cell, whereas in HER2 positive, you know, an average cell may have a normal uh, breast cancer cell may have you know 10 to 100 HER2 protein on the surface of its cell. In a HER2 positive, maybe a thousand, maybe ten thousand. So, um, you know, the reason the antibody drug conjugates work is there are probably enough HER2 proteins on the HER2 low cells that, that to get the drug, the payload, into the cell. It's not necessarily that those HER2 proteins are driving the growth of the cell like they are in HER2 positive. So we have another uh, question about the um, about neuratinib, and this question really is you know, is talking about uh, preventing, maybe helping to prevent brain mats, and does another drug need to be added to prevent brain mats from developing in triple positive patients? Um, I hope I get this question right. That's a good question. No, I, I see what they're getting at because. Okay. We're using anti-estrogen CDK4-6 and, um, you know, an antibody. Um, yeah. Do you have this, you know, are you leaving the CNS uh, exposed, if you will? Um, it's a great question. And, you know, I think there's the potential uh, to consider adding to catnip to that combination. Uh, it didn't have a lot of toxicity. Um and the tox side effects of tocatinib shouldn't overlap uh, with any of those uh, drugs. So that would be an interesting um, a study to be done moving forward. So the question about, um, hmm, interesting. Um, you know, why cancer cells develop resistance to treatment? You know, is there's why? anything? Um, yeah, that's a big question. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
uh, and we don't fully know the answer to that. I mean, that they're 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 you know programmed to survive, right? And so, um, you know, and the body and the cells are incredibly redundant. The body is incredibly redundant, and so when we block, you know, one target. There's always a, uh, a compensation that occurs in the cell to try and maintain its survival. And so, um, you know, the analogy I use with patients sometimes is, you know, if you have had kids and they had ear infections, you know, you get the same antibiotic over and over for their ear infections and eventually it would stop working because that bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic. So you have to try something new to treat the infection. It's kind of very similar to what we're doing and trying to, um, you know, do this dance with the cancer cells. So there was another study that came out with San Antonio that I would like to, to talk about. Um, and it really was the exercise study in NBC, which um, typically we've had studies for early breast cancer. And this is the first one about exercise and, and metastatic breast cancer. And it looked at structured, personalized exercise programs. And there were some pretty dramatic results about the quality of life. Um, can we talk a little bit about that and um, you know, how we might, how you would talk to patients um, about exercise? Yeah, so we actually, um, so when we see a new patient in our center, um, as part of their first visit, um, they see a team, and uh, that includes a psychologist, a nutritionist, social worker, and a physical therapist. Um, and they're assessed by the physical therapist, and we're actually looking at our data trying to see if we can identify, it looks like we can identify three groups of patients. Um, you know, those that are, are pretty um, disabled, if you will, by their cancer in, the, in their current status those who are uh, still very functional and ambulatory, but have really been deconditioned by the cancer. Um, and then those that are, you know, minimally symptomatic and still pretty active. And so we're trying to see what interventions would be best in each of those situations so that hopefully you can improve the quality of life regardless of the starting point of where the patients are, and hopefully you can move from one group to the next, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that um, we've, you're right. We've uh, uh, had a lot of data on exercise in early stage breast cancer. Um, there was also some data on, on fasting, on fasting mimicking diets uh, prior to chemotherapy um, in metastatic disease. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we need to incorporate a lot more uh, quality of life uh, measures to improve, um, you know, nutrition, exercise. Um, we actually um, have one of our psychologists who uh, 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 trained uh, um, in, in sexual dysfunction, so she has started a program on uh, sexuality for metastatic breast cancer patients, uh, which is, I think, oftentimes discounted um, um, as being important. But when you look at the data, um, some of the surveys we did, and there was a poster uh, at San Antonio that we presented, um, it's, it's important to patients, very important to patients. And so, um, so we uh, started this program ar around that to address that as well in terms of quality of life. Yeah, that's great. Cause it is, you know, especially with the treatments um, improving and maybe less side effects, um, you know, we have to have to have those studies so that we can help, help us even live better. So um, right. that's important. So thank you for doing those. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Pluard, for your thoughtful and thorough answers to these many questions. We'll have a recording of this program available on our website in one to two weeks. Also, please make sure to check SHARE's website for upcoming educational programs, podcast episodes, and support groups. And don't forget to follow us on social media as well. 
Please take a moment to fill out the, the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will pop up in the browser and when the webinar ends and the link will also be um, in a follow-up email, all surveys are anonymous. This concludes the webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Pluard, and I hope that everyone has a great, great afternoon. Thank you all for joining. Thanks again. Thank you.